This is Mr. Craig and I want to talk about the last page of examples for day 103 in kinetics. Uh, part C is the first thing I want to talk about is reaction mechanisms. Now up until this point we have talked about a balanced equation looking very very simple like this equation right here. Um, we always start off with a set of reactants and we finish with a set of products and based on these reactants and products we're able to balance the equation and be happy and move on in our happy joyous life. The reality is most reactions that take place in the universe do not happen in one quote unquote step. There's what's called intermediate steps. In other words what we can't see is what's going on with this arrow. In other words how these reactants changed into the products here. If we look at this reaction here the reality is that there's actually two steps in the reaction where two nitrogen monoxides, and this isn't balanced, I don't believe it may be, it may not be, uh, the balanced equation, I'm sorry, the reaction takes two molecules of nitrogen dioxide and forms a nitrogen trioxide and a nitrogen monoxide. And then in the next step, that nitrogen trioxide reacts with the carbon monoxide to form the, the products nitrogen dioxide and carbon dioxide. Now when we look at this reaction, we have to recognize that there are things on both sides of the equation that quote unquote don't even appear in the balanced equation up here. Like for example, the nitrogen trioxide does not appear at all in this balanced equation. Um, we have a total of three nitrogen dioxides in the equation, but we only have one up here in our original equation. The good news is you will never ever have to predict intermediates or reaction steps. If you go on in with chemistry, you'll find out that as a reaction takes place that there are these intermediates that are formed. And sometimes you may want to stop the reaction when a certain intermediate is formed. But for the, the scope of this class, we aren't going to be concerned about the intermediates and they will be given to you. So whenever you look at um, an equation that has quote unquote elementary steps or steps of the reaction, we want to cancel out alike terms. Now what I've done here in this is I've shown the two steps of the reaction, I've written everything down, these are all the things that are on the reactant side and these are all the products that are on the product side. And then what we want to do is cancel out alike terms to get our final balanced equation. And we'll do an example like that here in a moment. But the key here is you do not have to predict intermediates. And again, intermediates are products that are produced in between the first step and the final step. Okay, so don't freak out on that. You'll always be given that information. Um, let's do an example problem here. Uh, the example says using the, the two elementary steps shown below, uh, construct the balanced equation to determine, actually there's more than two steps here. There's actually four steps. So what I'm, we're going to work out and find out which things can be canceled out and which things move on here. Um, so we're going to get a balanced equation here. So I'm going to move this up just a little bit. Let's go ahead and go to this part. I'm going to draw on here. Whoops, I did not want to do that. Let's cancel that. Let's go back. Okay. So first thing that I want to do is I want to cancel out anything that shows up on opposite sides. Like so, for example, here I have an oxygen here and an oxygen there. That one can go away. So that will not go down here in this balanced equation. Um, I have two nitrogen dioxides, but they're on the same side. I do have a nitrogen trioxide here and a nitrogen trioxide there. I also have a NOF on both sides. And I have... NOF2 on both sides. Now let's check for the remaining. There are no, oh there is one. There's one NO2 there and there's one NO2 there. Alright, so there's no fluorines, F2s, on this side. There's two NO2s on this side but no others on this side. So let's write down everything that remains. So we have two NO2s plus a fluorine which yields, and everything that remains, looks like we have two 
NO 2F. Now, if this was done correctly, we should have the same number of atoms on both sides. So let's check where we have two nitrogen, two nitrogen. We have two times two, which is four oxygen, two times two, which is four oxygen, two fluorine, two fluorine. We are good to go. Okay, so these are actually fun problems. What I don't want you to do is freak out and look at the the steps and say to yourself, whoa, how are we supposed to do this? Cancel out terms that are on opposite sides of the arrow. I'm not sure what that property is in math, if it's the associative property. I'm not a math teacher, so I'm not 100% sure. But if it appears on opposite sides of the equation, you're going to cancel it out. You're not going to cancel everything out. In other words, like the NO2 that was here, we didn't cancel all the NO2s. We canceled one of each. So it's kind of like doing the redox problems that we did earlier in the year. All right. Um, determining the rate laws from the elementary steps and the rate determining step. Now up here, I didn't tell you which which reaction or which step was fast and which one was slow and so on and so forth. I just gave you all the intermediate steps and I wanted to know what was the balanced equation. Down here in this problem, we can actually determine the rate law from the rate determining step. And the way that we do that is we you'll be given information and if you're asked to do this you'll be given information where you'll see things that say this this step is fast that one's fast this one's slow this one's fast and we don't really care how fast fast is just realize that it's faster than the slowest step so when we go in determine the rate determining step it's kind of like an analogy that I use when I go into the grocery store I know exactly what I want to buy I'd say I need to go pick up a gallon of milk I have to walk all the way through the store to the back of the grocery store, grab the milk, and then I go to the checkout counter. And before the use scan or the self-serve aisles were produced, this was a great story. But I would have to stand in line and wait for all the other people to get checked out, and then when it was my turn, then I would pay for the gallon of milk and then leave the store. Now, there were a couple steps there. First of all, getting into the store, going and getting the milk, from the store, going to the line, getting through the line, and then getting out. And the rate determining step for me is always the checkout line. In other words, I have to stop and I have to wait and I have to watch other people use their coupons, write out their checks. Unless I'm doing a five finger discount, that is the rate determining step. I cannot get out of that store any quickly, any more quickly than getting through the checkout aisle. So when we look at a reaction, the slow step is the rate determining step. So if we know what the rate determining step is, then we can actually go and do a, um, a real neat calculation here and actually write down what the rate, or I'm sorry, write down what the rate law is based on that. And here's how it goes. The rate law can be determined. If you know the rate determining step, uh, the rate law will be written to include all the reactants minus the intermediates up to and including the slow step. So the first thing that we need to do is find the slow step. So what we want to do is we want to get eliminate all intermediates. Again, an intermediate is something that is produced and later used as a reactant. So our first intermediate that's produced is C. A plus B yields C. And then C is later used as a reactant later on. So product that is used as a reactant, that is an intermediate. Okay. Now these two B's here are both reactants, so we're not going to cancel any of those out. Plus they're on the same side. Then if I look at the second step where it says C plus D forms D and E, both D and E are intermediates, so they are going to get canceled out. So I don't want to even look at those. Now that I'm to my slow step, I have to say to myself, I'm going to include all reactants minus the intermediates. Well, the only thing that remains up until the slow step is 1A and 2Bs. Okay, this is my rate determ This is to write my rate law. So when I look at this, I can now write my rate law as this rate. Actually, let me lower this down a little bit. Rate is equal to whatever K is. We don't know what K is yet. And since I have 1A, that is a first order reactant. I have 2Bs, 
that is a second order reactant. So my rate law is right here. So again, I'm going to show all reactants up to and including the slow step minus the intermediates. Now, remember, a reactant can only be zero, first, or second order. You'll notice that there is a second A that appears after the slow step. We would not include that second A in our rate law because it appears after the slow step. So it doesn't matter what the concentration of this A is because it's not going to speed the reaction up any more quickly. So here's my rate law and we'll get a chance to do some more work on that. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is a catalyst. Now we've talked about catalysts in general, Kim. Um, catalysts do a couple things. The first thing that they do uh, is help organize a reaction. So a catalyst is an organizer. In other words, it, it, it actually takes the particle and positions it in such a way that it can collide correctly with a, another particle. So it actually causes the activation energy to be lower. A catalyst is never consumed in a reaction. Um, oftentimes a catalyst can change throughout the reaction, but it always comes back in its original form. So if I start off, say, with 10 grams of magnesium in a reaction, if I don't get 10 grams of magnesium at the end of the reaction, then it was a reactant. So a catalyst is never consumed in a reaction. It acts like an organizer, and it helps lower the activation energy. So when we look at, say, the graph here, that top line is an uncatalyzed reaction because the activation energy is so much greater because there's no catalyst there. However, when we add a catalyst, it does not require as much energy for the reaction to proceed or for the reactants to change into products. So be sure that you know what a catalyst does. Um, oftentimes a catalyst may appear in an equation, but it always comes back in the same form. So if I look at, say, this equation up here, I might ask you, who is the catalyst? Or can you tell me what the catalyst is? Well, I'm looking at this and I don't see anything that starts off A, B, or G. Actually, G is an intermediate, so we wouldn't look at that. So A, B doesn't come back in its original form here. So there is no catalyst in this reaction. And you'll get a chance to do that on the homework. I hope this has helped.